this week on the Back Table Podcast. So what you have to do is decide, okay, am I doing this to become a company like Shockwave, where I'm going to go out and sell it on my own, or Inari? There's such a big demand for this that I'm going to be able to do this as a company no matter what. Or am I only doing this to sell it? You know, when you go to do strategics, have a non-disclosure agreement, you have to be able to tell your story. It has to be one, really good for patients. It's got to be, and I live by this one, doctors do what's easy within one standard deviation of efficacy. So if you make their job harder, it's going to be a hard sell. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Innovation Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on Backtable.com. This is our next installment in the Backtable Innovation Show, where you'll hear stories from physician entrepreneurs who are helping to drive healthcare forward through medtech innovation. This is Brian Hartley as your host this week. I'm a radiologist living in Nashville and co-founder of an early stage imaging company in the pulmonary space. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest this week, Dr. Gary Ansel. Dr. Ansel is an internationally renowned interventional cardiologist, as well as a successful entrepreneur. He's the inventor of the eponymous Ansel Sheath and founder of Imbala Tech, uh, which developed the Pounce thrombectomy system, recently acquired by Sermotics. He's also a founding member of the Viva Vascular Conference. Lots to talk about here. So with that, Gary, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Really look forward to it. Awesome. So let's start off. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, where you practiced, are you still practicing? Sure. So um, I'm an interventional cardiologist from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I've been both in private practice and employed practice. Um, I was um, active clinically until just a little over a year ago when I stepped back from the clinical realm to start um, another company called Healthcare Insights with Dr. Michael Jaff and Steve Cagnetta. And that's a strategic uh, advisory company. Okay, that's great. That's awesome. So tell us, how did you get into medicine? How did, what was your path to getting uh, into medicine? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of roundabout. Uh, I grew up in a poor area of Columbus and my dad was a TV repairman. And I was going to be a TV repairman. We had five boys. But remember back then, TVs were huge. We used to call the big ones that had stereos in them coffins because they were so big. <laughs> Well, they and, all came in boxes, right? Yeah, I guess. yeah, exactly. And my dad used to laugh. He goes, you know, sometimes the really rich people would just want the insides done because it was a piece of furniture. It was. <laughs> you know, you'd have the speakers were in these like cabinets. Absolutely. And uh, so I was, uh, yeah, I was probably out of, I was a middle kid and, um, you know, I had the most interest in the business. And so he would come in when I was in high school and just pull in the parking lot and ask where I was. And they'd go, he's in class. He'd go, I didn't ask you how or how do I get him? I just told him, get him. Ah, so I he'd mean, pull you out of school. Yeah, he'd pull me out of school. And everybody laughed because his TV truck squeaked and it had all these speed bumps. <laughs> and, you know, we didn't have air conditioning. I mean, we had heat in the winter, but we didn't have air conditioning in the summer. You know, mm -hmm. you just hear this van going over the speed bumps and everybody oh, just man. look at me because they knew what was going to happen. Oh, man. And uh, so, but he was the first person in Ohio to put a TV rental in a hospital. They weren't included wow. with your room. And so, wow. uh, you know, he was, you know, he's where we all got our entrepreneurial spirit. But uh, so I was going to be a TV repairman. And then I was like, I don't know. 14 or 15, he came in, he goes, you can, you're not going to have the business. And I was so insulted because I was spending my weekends, my evening, I mean, come on, he's taking me out of school. And uh, he said, and he pulled out this little solid state uh, panel and it was from Quasar Works in a Drawer. And he goes, in 10 years, they'll be so cheap, they'll just throw them away, which is right. That's what happened. But you know, I thought, man, what am I going to do now? <laughs> I've got to do something different. I had no idea, mm -hmm. but I liked being in the hospital, I liked how nice he talked about all the doctors. So I thought, well, I'll be one of those. I had no <laughs> idea how hard it was to do that. Well, you went to college. You you were an athlete, correct? Right. So I played football in high school and I tried to play college football and I got injured both the first two years. And mm -hmm. actually one of the uh, orthopedic guys goes, do you get a ha at least half decent grades? I go, yeah. He goes, just go do that. 
He goes, because you're going to hurt yourself bad. So, because it was a neck injury and stuff. And I, oh, thought, wow. Oh. Yeah. So I was like, all right, whatever. And so, um, what position did you play? I was a wide receiver and a cornerback in high school. Oh. I've been both ways. And in college, I tried to be a cornerback and mm-hmm. it, it just, it didn't heal up good enough. And, mm. you know, <laughs> it was just one of those things where I'd had this huge neck. I wasn't that big a guy, but I had a big neck, but it just wasn't good enough. But anyway, it got me into a small college. And, um, you know, I, I actually, I was living in animal house, <laughs> which was no. terrible, but, uh, my advisor said, Hey, you know what? You have the grades, but you don't have the attitude to be a doctor. So figure out something else. Wow. And I was like, John Belushi, what am I going <laughs> to do now? And my <laughs> sister was a nurse. So I called her up and she said, Hey, there's this field of respiratory technology that's just starting. And I think you can get into that. So I transferred to Ohio state. I, I got into that. They were very nice. It was great education, but I also knew I wanted to be my own boss. And mm-hmm. uh, so I taught for a couple of years while I got the rest of my pre-med requirements. And uh, then went back to medical school and uh, at Ohio State. And then uh, it was funny because I, <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to be. I was going to be a surgeon until I saw one of the surgeons apologize for cutting on somebody before they knew what was wrong with her. And I went, I got to be smarter because, you know, <laughs> come on, I got to be smarter. I can't cut on people before I know what's going on. And so um, I started an internal medicine residency up in Toledo, Ohio, at the, what then was called the Medical College of Ohio. Mm-hmm. And I, did, I just didn't know what I was going to be. And there was this great ENT guy there. And I thought, I really like doing this. So, yeah, I did a bunch of electives with him. And I actually got offered a spot at Mayo Clinic, an ENT. Wow. And then my, the only specialty my dad ever talked bad about, which was wrong, but he did, was E-E-N-T because he mm. just, I don't know, it was, but, and I, I just couldn't do it. I thought my dad will sit on my shoulder telling me, oh man, you know, what are you doing? And I thought I, I got into a cold sweat because I had to let him know by the next day. And I was on call and I thought, well, what don't I mind going to the ER? Because I, I like, you know, being a doctor. I, I like doing what I'm doing. And. I didn't mind going to the ER for heart attacks because it was exciting. Things were happening, things like that. And I thought, well, all right, I'm going to be a cardiologist. So I turned down my ENT spot, which didn't go over very well. And then wow. uh, I, you know, called up the guys from Ohio State. And I go, I want to be a kid. I still didn't know how hard this was. <laughs> I go, hey, I want to be a cardiologist. They go, well, Gary, you know, it's hard to get in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't going to stop you. No, that didn't bother me at all. I, you know, honestly, I, you know, the program I was at was a small program for my fellowship. I'm sorry, for my residency. And I mean, back then I was working with the cardiologist all the time, my last two years. And I was doing angioplasties and heart caths and valvuloplasties with a guy named Mark Burkett. Ted Franker was the chairman, but they really treated me well. So once I got my training, it was really interesting. I said, gosh, you know, I really like cardiology, but, you know, how many, how many different ways can you blow up a balloon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so they- a, a, lo- a lot, apparently. <laughs> yeah. But they said, hey, you know what? I said, you know, the private practice of Columbus was offering me a job and, you know, Toledo was offering me a job. And I thought, well, there's this new field called vascular and- uh I said, whoever could get me trained, but there wasn't training. Mm-hmm. So the private practice e- too easily said, ah, you know, we'll get you trained in that. And I thought that was too fast of an answer because there really isn't any. And Ted Franker up at the medical college said, give me three weeks. And then he wow. called me back three weeks later and he said, you want to go back to Mayo Clinic or you want to, you know, go down to Auctioner Clinic in New Orleans? And I thought, well, it's going to start in the winter time. Maybe we'll go where it's warm. So I went, <laughs> I went to Oxford Clinic and worked with Steve Ramey and Chris White, Ty Collins, and uh, Larry Ollier was the surgeon, and Frank Kazmaier was the uh, vascular medicine guy from Mayo that had gone down there. And I fell in love. I mean, mm-hmm. I loved doing what I was doing. I loved the guys I worked with. And so then I went back to Toledo for a couple of years and uh, did started a vascular program there. And then they recruited me back to Columbus. So I, I came back to my hometown, which was, you know, you dream of that. And it's, it was a really big, busy program at Riverside Methodist Hospital. Uh, it, back then, it was a private practice called Mid-Ohio Cardiology. So, you know, it started there. And Barry George was my mentor, and uh, we took it off from there. It's been a great, great ride, let me tell you. <laughs> 
I mean, I've met so many great people. Like it was funny, my that first conference I was telling you about, I actually went to Milwaukee to see vascular. And here, my best friend and colleague and everybody was up on the screen as the fellow, Mike Jaff for wow. Jerry Doros. And it was, I had lunch with John Laird. I mean, it was just all the people that I ended up hanging out with were at that conference and I, I had no idea. So it was, <laughs> it was a great, great run. And so it's been, been fun. No, that's awesome. That's a great story. And so when did you formally get involved with entrepreneurship? W when did that happen? Well, you know, I, tr I tried actually when I was a respiratory therapist, I tried to come up with a device that would be a better incentive spirometer, but it probably was my second or second year being at Mid-Ohio. You know, we were doing a lot of vascular and the big procedure at that time was renal for renal stenting. Yep. And we were using big devices. I mean, remember, we didn't have closure devices back then. And uh, we were doing eight French sheaths for an eight French guiding catheter and stenting the renal arteries that way. Holding pressure for a while on those, I'm sure. Yeah. And, it, and you know, it was like, that's where they bled from cardiology. It's where they bled from here. So, you know, a really perfect procedure could be messed up because of a, you know, groin problem. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as we were doing it, the companies kept on giving us smaller devices. And I also thought, why do we put two different tubes in this groin? We could just use a shape tube with a dilator and use a sheath tube, you know, a sheath guide. And so Barry George and I actually sat down and thought about, hey, what different shapes would we need to do the majority? And we came up with three shapes. We called up our rep from Cook because they had the they had the reputation for helping people and doing, you know, new devices to them. That's how Cook became Cook. And so in three weeks, we had our first prototypes. Three weeks. Wow. And so we kept on working at it. And it wasn't very long. Three months, we had really devices that we could use. And uh, they were awesome. And I was telling you the story that, gosh, it was probably about five or six months later, I asked for an, you know, an Ansel sheath because they said they wanted to put my name on it. I go, nobody knows who I am. I don't care. <laughs> and, uh, they, for, and they actually asked at first if I wanted royalties. And I thought, well, I don't know if I want that conflict. There's only how many renals done in the United States. And hmm. you know, for that percentage, I'm not going to make much money. Ah, well, forget it. Well, six months later, I asked for one and they go, I'm sorry, we're out. And I got a hold of the rep and I said, can't you guys make these things? He goes, we can't make them fast enough. Everybody's wow. using them for everything. And I went, cool. Can, yep. we, re can we revisit that royalty? <laughs> can, we, can we talk about that again? Is that door still open? And, and it was. They were very nice about it. I've had a really good uh, relationship with Cook over the years. And though we've both changed over the years, that was a great start to being an entrepreneur. And my dad and everybody had always said, you know, you know, what's the secret to having your own business? Find something people need or want. And that's, you know, the entrepreneur stuff, as you know, Brian, it's yeah. find pain points that there's a bunch of, come up with a really good answer. And uh, that's how you do it. No, that's great. So you, you, within three weeks, you went to Cook, you said, I got an idea. Within three weeks, you had prototypes. Were there patents involved in this or did they file all the patents? This was more like a, hey, you know, I'd like a better device. I'm going to help you guys out, but you give me what I need. Yeah, that's really what how it started. It, it was them, you know, I was stupid. I had no idea how the process worked. They took care of all the patent stuff. I was really came to them with, hey, there's a big clinical need for this. This is my idea. Do you think it's a good idea? You know, can you help me out? And then I'll be helping you out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that relationship has lasted for a long time because it went from Ansel Sheese to critical limb ischemia about, I don't know, about 10 years later, I said, hey, you know, the field is heading towards this way. This is what we need. Let's partner together again. And uh, we adjusted balloons and uh, that's where the CXI came about, different things like that. So we've, we've had a good relationship over the years. That's great. And, I, and I'm going to ask a question. You don't have to answer this, but what does a royalty check look like? You know, I know a lot of us probably think if you invent, if you invent something, it sounds great. I mean, at the beginning, were you, I mean, are you buying extra coffees or are you buying extra car, house or beach house? Like, how does this, how does this work? What level are we? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it, it's always, at least a help for me, it was always post net. I mean, it was net so that, you know, they could write off all the expenses for the devices and stuff. 
typically if you do that, because I I didn't know that at the time, I I was going to take whatever they're Meaning giving me. Meaning it's profits, I guess yeah. is what you're saying. And, it's post right. whatever they're- Yeah, it's yeah, profits. Okay. And it was 2%, which was okay. you know, really fair for me not bringing them patents and you know really sure. just an idea. And at first, I we we laugh because my wife goes, I think they should just save the money on writing those checks because it okay. probably cost them more. But over the years, once it finally caught on, if you're doing something that's used a lot, and like when they opened up Asia, all of a sudden mm-hmm. those checks got really big, and okay. you know it it was my retirement fund, you know, part of my retirement fund got to it. do that. And so I mean, it again it. It could be a really, you know, sheath is not that expensive, right? And you're talking mm-hmm. 2%. But when you're doing the, the, luckily, I mean, I was very humbled that it became the number one interventional sheath in the world. Wow. And that's a lot of procedures worldwide. No doubt. So would you do anything different if you go back now, you're, you're a little bit smarter or more experienced, let's say, on your, on your entrepreneurship j- journey? Would you have done anything different or you like the way things turned out there? Well, you know, honestly, I liked the way things turned out there at that time because it was a great way for not having experience. But cooks change. They don't do that anymore. I mean, you can't get a, you know, a prototype in three weeks. They act much more like a big strategic, even though a private company. Um, And that's the difference. You know, there's the there's the cooks and the gores that are big private companies, family owned. And then there's the strategics that are public companies like the Medtronics in Boston, two different you know, environments without a doubt. I mean, that's a good point. But to get my toe in the water to think, help figure out, you know, how the process worked to become much smarter as we went along, I mean, and to learn what it really took to get things, it was, it was a great beginning. I mean, I don't think it could be repeated nowadays. Why is that? Yeah. What would happen now? And in, in just to give our listeners an idea. Yeah. I think now, I think one, they would be asking for pets. They want to know, Mm -hmm. hey, am I going to be protected with this? They want to know, you know, again, most of the companies look for big ticket items, stuff that's much more expensive. They're not looking for one-offs. And, you know, the the sheath was one thing, but you had, I mean, we were, it was being paid for back then, but now everything's bundled. So when you add something to a procedure, you can't add on, I mean, you can't add cost. If you come up with an idea that, they could make more money and not build the, the hospital that much more. That would be a good idea, but those are hard to come up with. But nowadays, you have to come up with a patent. And when you say patent, when you say patent, you mean like a granted patent or like a provisional patent? Because I know our listeners are probably thinking, okay, I'll file a provisional on uh, on my new idea, my new you know device or catheter. Is that enough, or do you think? You probably need a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, you need more. A, a granted patent. And the reason being is because a patent's even only one more step. But then, like, when you've got the company, like when we had in Bolitech, and you're going to sell that, the whole bigger thing that I had no idea about is this freedom to operate. You know, mm. how, how, how open, how easily you're going to be able to sell this thing without somebody coming back at you. Yeah. And that's, and that's, yeah. that's a much bigger deal. But that's something that is down the road. Your first step, though, is a grantable patent, not just provisional. I think you have to have, you know, something that protects them. And that's the first big step to this. And then um, we talked, you know, Mark Woolley taught, taught me this a long time ago. He taught a bunch of us a lot of stuff. But we asked him one time to give a talk on what makes a successful company because he's been widely and highly successful as an interventional, interventional radiologist out of Pittsburgh that was an entrepreneur and inventor. And he said, you have to have one, a really big need. There has to be enough numbers of procedures that are going to use your device. There's got to be a really good answer and it has to be a value equation. It's got to be better for the patient, better for the doc. It's got to be less expensive for the hospital. It's got to have a value proposition. And then you have to have a really good business, you know, guy behind you, somebody who knows this stuff. The the best ideas that I've seen fall uh, are ones where the inventor maybe was an engineer or a doc and they tried to kind of get a little bit. I, I agree it's a hard term because, I mean, you do want, you know, re- reinforcement for what you're doing. Yeah, return. Yeah, but the reality of it is if you get a device patented and you get it all the way to 
even where if you maybe do clinicals, you're talking as the inventor, you might luck out and get about 8% of that with some royalties. By the um, end. Yeah, so if you're end. talking about if you're building uh, a company, um, then it takes a lot. It takes a village to build that up it and does. equity spread around. And by the time, you because know, you're going to need uh, millions of dollars in investment. And, yeah. you know, those investors are going to take a piece of the pie. Exactly. I think that's a fantastic rule of thumb that I've heard throughout, you know, my time in this world is usually the inventors, founders, by the end, you're looking at single digits. And if you get high single digits, it's a good it's a good return right. for you. And that may be years later. Like, you know, it will, in fact, it will be years later, correct? Yeah. Yes. You know, maybe so, a decade. Yeah, my, my second success was more than a decade that the Ambolitech company that was a kind of like a, um, an embolectomy company that kind of answered stuff. It took me over 10 years. I mean, <laughs> and it's Perfect not for segue. The, yeah, let's not, let's not talk about the, Ambolitech. Yeah. It was not for the faint of heart. Yeah. You know, so I was a cardiologist and, you know, but we were still doing a lot of the acute limbs and we had a Fogarty really, or... yeah, yeah. And so we had a great relationship with our surgeons early on. Most of them were cardiothoracic that did vascular, you know, it was scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I mean, it was, it was, we got along very well and, you know, we would be there sometimes in the, in the cases together. They might be sitting at behind the glass, just seeing if I was going to be successful or not. <laughs> Right. But we always had, yeah, we could take out soft clot. I was one of the original POSIS uh, uh, advisors and we could take soft clot out pretty easily, but it was that fibrosy, the organized stuff that we still have a hard time with. So that was our Achilles heel. That's what I'd either have to do thrombolytics for, and the pages and complications, or we have to send to the OR for Fogarty. And that's always, a, even, even when the surgeon's my buddy, it gives just a semblance of a complication to the family. What went wrong? Why couldn't you mm. handle it? That kind of to stuff. To send it to a surgeon, yeah. Yeah. And so it was, you know, it, it was our Achilles heel. And so I went to Pasis early on and I said, hey, this is your Achilles heel. We got to get this fixed. And at first they didn't listen. The engineers didn't understand. And finally, they were actually in my lab looking at a new tip on their device. And we got one of those cases that had organization with it. And I had a surgeon take it out and I brought it to the engineer and I made him put on gloves and feel it. And I go, that's what we can't get out. And he goes, I had no idea. And I go, well, <laughs> I can't fire you because I'm not part of POSIS, <laughs> but I would. <laughs> I, I love that, that you, you were like, I'm going to show you exactly uh, what the problem is. But for our listeners, can you set the time frame of between when uh, the Ansel sheath was going on and when you started with, sounds like you were consulting with POSIS on kind of uh, the embolectomy, em yeah. uh, thrombectomy device. It was probably six years, six six to eight years after that. And that, that was 98? No. Yeah, when pretty was, close. When, okay. uh, it had been, uh, well, the, uh, the, the Ansel sheath, sheath would have been there. 98 and then probably about 2009, 2010 is when we first started, you know, really seriously talk with POSIS to come Got up it. with the new device. Okay. And, and, you know, you figure it. And I said, I want a percutaneous Fogarty. I want to have what the surgeons have, but without a big incision and the infection that goes with it and all that kind of stuff. And so the first idea was, you know, I had it drawn on paper. I said, it's a plastic funnel and a balloon. And yeah, they actually had a balloon at that time that they were, you know, utilizing to try to stop flow. And that didn't work. <laughs> the mm -hmm. hydraulics work against you. And as soon as you release the the balloon to let it come into the tube, it did keep a hold, even if you're aspirating it. And, and then you're aspirating a whole bunch. And I, I wanted a device that didn't have a power unit, didn't aspirate a whole bunch of blood, didn't hemolyze, and could take out everything, you know, all the all the organized or unorganized clot. I mean, I wanted everything, right? That's how you that's how you start your idea. And so then we worked on it for a long time and they said, you know, we just can't figure this out. And I said, that's who you are. Are you kidding me? And I go, well, let me go back to my garage again. And so, you know, I started messing in my garage and kind of figured out what we were working against. And I go, gosh, we could get out kidney stones. <laughs> I went, ah. So I looked at all the different ways we take out tough stuff. And we kind of, uh, and I said, what's the major problem is the clot has so much mass to it. I mean, come on. Sometimes these are the entire length of your leg. I go, this is going to be hard. But what we figured out is we could use a nitinol kind of braided wire funnel 
that would cut the, you know, fibrousy stuff and let the moisture get out like cheesecloth and actually de decrease the amount of stuff we had to remove. And then we used a, a night and all basket. And, you know, that seemed to work pretty good. And they got excited about that. And then and when they were doing it, they called me up. They said, hey, you know what? We, we think we need to use two baskets. And I went, two? And they go, well, it's about 60% successful with one on our bench top. But we had that second basket. It's up to 90 some percent. Wow. And so we went down that pathway. And then probably one of the better stories is we're doing an animal lab. I'm in Minneapolis. We're doing an animal lab. And we do a clot in an animal. We pull it all out with one pull through a seven French sheath. And I was like, I stopped and I go, you guys, there's a time in your career where you think I might've changed history of medicine. <laughs> and then everybody clapped and laughed. Well, the second part of that animal lab was a drug coated balloon. And I, <laughs> and I got a call three months later and said, we just don't have the bandwidth, which means money to do both projects. So drug coated balloons, a bigger potential, you know, ring the bell mm -hmm. for uh, our company. So we're not going to do your device. And I was like, are you kidding me? And so, oh. and so I, I shamed them into giving me the patent because my name were on the patents. And so we got the patents and they said, yeah, go at it. Well, then they got sold to bear. Then bear got sold to BSC, but when they were sold to bear, you know, they said, yeah, you know, go for it. They hedged a little bit at the end, but at, in the end, it all worked out. And uh, I actually started traveling around to get angel money. I had a business guy that I brought on named Rod Gador. Uh, he uh, unfortunately passed away this last year, but he was an oncologist that did a lot of business stuff and he was awesome. And he had, he knew everybody. And so uh, we started, we, I remember we went to um, just north of uh, Seattle and met a couple of people for angel money. And they said, yeah, this sounds great. So I hadn't signed for it yet. And it was right before ICIT. So I'm going up that big escalator at ICIT and a guy from another strategic is coming down the, the other side. He goes, hey, I need to talk to you real quick. And he comes up to me, he goes, remember that little throwback to me, Kath, you're telling me about, did you ever do anything with that? I said, I just got somebody to give me angel money. We have to sign for it in like two days. He goes, don't do that. We want it. We want to develop it. And I was like, are you kidding me? And he goes, no. And I go, all right. So I stuck the business guy on him and it took some negotiations, but they ended up getting it. Now, that's not sermonics. No. So when this company, basically you said Possus decided they were also doing the drug coated balloon and they decided that they weren't going to go after thrombectomy device anymore. And how long had you worked on it with them up uh, to that point? Three years. Okay. So I just want to be clear to the listeners that you spent three years developing a relationship, building devices, prototyping, iterating, animal labs, and then the, the basically the rug got pulled a little bit right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it ended up being... Now, one thing I want to point out, it ended up being a blessing in disguise. You know, when that rug got pulled, it allowed you to get those patents. And I think that was a brilliant... Whose idea was that to say, this is still worth going after? I just told you about this animal lab. I think it's incredible. My colleagues, I guarantee you, would want this in their practice. How do you start the process of saying, I need that intellectual property? Did you pay them for it? Did they just give it to you because they felt bad? Or what happened here? Well, it's the, it was the blessing of them being a, a single product company. I don't, they're not, yeah. They weren't really a startup anymore. But we had a long relationship. I had done a lot of work with them. And all our names were on that patent. And, you know, they, uh, they saw the clinical need. Uh, we actually probably became friends, which was probably not a good thing for them. But, uh, you know, at it, 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 this day and age, I don't think this would happen at all. We say that a lot, I found. Our yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the reality of it is I lived in a golden age. I mean, it was, it really worked out well. And they were, and they did, they saw the clinical need. And you know what, this is, a, this is something that people don't realize. And all the companies that I've worked with, which has been a ton, you know, from major strategic to startup, people that are in those companies, they have an inherent good feeling about working in the healthcare industry. I mean, I remember this guy who used to work for Apple and he left because he wasn't doing stuff to help people. That's the altruism factor. They, they, there is. And so I, I guess I played on that. 
and they <laughs> they gave it to me. Well, you me. said patients need patients need this device. I uh, but yeah. I imagine that's what did. your argument went. Yeah, and we, I mean, and that's that's why they worked on it in the first place. They saw the need. They saw that it it really needed to be out there, and I think they hoped that if I got it developed, that they would buy it from me, and I was still their friend, so I'd give it to them cheaper. Oh my gosh! You know, but you know that didn't happen. Well, take it. All right, take us back to where we were. So you're at. Uh, you start. You're like, you know what? I'm going to found a company out of this. I know it's a single product, but I bet you could build a company out of it because it sounds like you found a business person. And we did. Were you going to go through sales? I mean, were you thinking about distributing it yourself or going to a strategic at that after you got it going? That's a good question. So the business guy and I talked about that. We said, you know, well, first thing we want to do was, you know, where are we going to go with this? And I said, well. We knew it would be millions of dollars to get it done, 510K or whatever approved, and then on the market. Back then, you didn't have to have sales. I mean, nowadays, mm -hmm. they like to see sales. When Back you say then, they, you're talking uh, about strategics, strategics who might yeah. potent potentially acquire you. Yeah, somebody who, somebody who might acquire you. They really do want to see sales nowadays, where back then, I mean, if you came up with a really good idea and they saw potential, they'd purchase mm -hmm. it without sales. Yep. But, uh, you know, but the, and that was a little different. Again, the company that, you know, was looking at it was one that wasn't a wasn't a public company. It was private and they they could, you know, actually invest in it and create. They liked creating things. And so uh, they moved down down the, that pathway and they uh, purchased it from us the first time. And I was on their advisory board and they would have a, a science fair every year. And now, again. It was in th three more years of development with them because there was, you know, we there was a lot of demand that we wanted to put on this device to be, you know, seven French, take out big clot, dehydrate the clot, cut the clot, and not lose it downstream and be efficient and fast. And, you know, kind of like you could figure it out just looking at it. I mean, that was a lot of desire. And so we were able to do that, but it took and a that's while. Six year, that's six years so total that's six from the year, beginning. Right. And so, okay. you know, we had a box, we had a label, we had completed the 510K just yet, but it was all almost all written. Mm -hmm. And I come back for an SAB and they go, well. When you say SAB. Oh, I'm sorry. Scientific Advisory Report. Okay. So we came for that and there was a bunch of us there. Again, these are my friends and they've voted it the number one product to expand their portfolio. So you're ready to rock and roll I'm ready with, to with, rock. This, I mean, with this company. They're on board. You're excited. It's been six years. You finally ground out all, you know, all of these parameters that it has to do. Right. And you're going to a scientific advisory board uh, with them. And what are you thinking? We're ready to go? Oh, I'm thinking we're ready to go. The only thing we still, we had one or two of the four or five patents that device ended up getting. But enough that they they thought the freedom to operate would be good, all that kind of stuff. And again, they lost a, a big court battle and they said, we're just going to hunker down to our core values. We're going to jettison everything else. Oh Luckily, again, this won't happen to, I don't think, very easily today. But we had in our contract that if you didn't commercialize it within, I think it was four or five years, that we got it back. We got the patents back. And, you know, now we were, you know, they were saying they weren't going to do it. And so, you know, I said, well, I want the pets back and I'll go get doing something else. And so, to again, you know, family owned, all that kind of non-public company. Mm -hmm. So we got the patents and we said, well, let's finish it off ourselves after a little depression of about a year. So then I happened to be in a in a, my office in the hospital and Sermotics who I was working with them on their drug-coated balloon program, they were in my office. They go, hey, we're thinking about doing more, and we're looking at thrombectomy devices. And I go, you are? Let me show you this. <laughs> and they fell in love with it. We did animal labs and bench top testing and everything, and then they ended up purchasing it, and it's now on the market, and it's doing what we wanted it to do. I mean, it's a seven French device. It's simple. No motor, you don't have to aspirate any blood, and it's pretty darn quick, and it takes out really hard stuff. Hmm. And so it's been, I mean, it, it's it's been a blessing to me because it's one of the reasons I left clinical practice is that I wanted to be able to go out and help them get it into the hospitals because, you know, Fogarty was how vascular surgery really took off. I mean, right. emergencies. 
And I thought the same thing's going to happen, you know, here that we can now really do stuff and help patients out. And so, uh, you know, I can help more patients now than I could ever do by myself. So it's been fun. Yeah, without a doubt. I want to back up just a little bit to that, that time when they, the strategics gave you back the second time, the strategic, I will say, or not strategic, the large company gave you back your patents for the thrombectomy device. Now, is this something, did you already have your business person working with you uh, when you were working with this large company? Were they helping you with a lot of this stuff? How important is a business person to have these things put in, you know, yeah, a contract? It, it's, it, it's indispensable. And the reason being is even when we were doing the contracts, he would tell me, don't get mad. They're going to put stuff in here you don't like. And he goes, and they're not going to tell you or me about it. They're just going to see if we notice. And he goes, it's just who they are. And you know what? He, from a, just a, from a business standpoint, they're incredibly important. They're also important to your, to your uh, potential investors. They want to know, hey, I know you think you have a great idea, but we know a business person's important, mm -hmm. so we want to meet him. Um, he also helped uh, something that was part of the story that we hadn't brought out yet. We had the one key patent we had been able to get for almost seven years. Every time we would submit it, they'd come up with two new reasons that it wasn't acceptable. And so we sat around, <laughs> we were at a bar one night at one of the meetings and he goes, there's got to be somebody like you in the patent, you know, search companies. I go, what do you mean? He goes, somebody who thinks outside the box. So we actually found the guy who was the ex-chief of the patent office. And we told him our story and he said, oh, sorry, I hired them. Oh, and the person who was yeah, not approving your patents. A, he said they have a very low- Approval uh, rate. Approval Grant rate. rate. Really, yeah. really low. And so he helped us. I mean, he was now out in private practice. So he helped us get our patents and then a couple more very quickly. And he also got it to be, you know, when your patent gets approved, you have so long that, it, that it's protected. Well, he, we got, we were able to move it back. Um, so we had a really long time of protection, both backwards and forwards. And that was indispensable. It made all the difference to the world. And without that business guy, we had never gotten that done. And again, Mark Willie said it, and I believe it. If you don't have a really good business guy, I don't care how good your idea is, most likely it's not going to be successful. Wow. You think as a physician that, you know, you're just going to, you're just going to be able to get it done. You've got a great product, right? You've got a great idea. You're going to turn it into a product. But again and again, when I interview physician founders like yourselves who have been successful in the past, they always have a team that includes a business person who became their, their, their partner in this journey. And I think there's just, sometimes there's a gap with physicians. They think we can... I hate to say this as physicians, we think we can do everything sometimes. And it's so important to have complimentary team members, especially in the business realm. Yeah, I, I, I totally believe that. Um, you know, you, there's a few things you need to have as you go through any ideas. And, you know, you, you always think your idea is really good because it's why you came up with it. Right. But it's really good to have honest friends who will tell you, this is good, this isn't good. It's always good to... Uh, include people in the in the success of your company. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I've seen over the years of watching other people is sometimes right when that sales occurring, people get kind of greedy and mm. they cannot be good to the employees or to the people that helped them get where they were. And that guy that was my business guy, he sold his business and he made a buco amount of money. What business was he? What, what so business? he was at he was in regulatory advising for um, for you know, large companies out of DC. He, he made really good money with it. And I remember my assistant was talking to his assistant. He, she said, you know, are you staying with him? What are you doing? You know, he sold the business. She goes, I'll stay with him forever. She goes, what do you mean? She, he goes, he came into our conference room, started writing checks that changed all our lives. You're kidding. And so I, I know I, so I called him up. I said, and, this, you... and he was helping you with he was helping yeah. you with your with your the, regulatory the regulatory stuff. But was he your business person or was he? Yeah, your... he was a business too. I mean, he for, was he, for the thrombectomy and, okay. exactly. And so he had his own, but he was helping me on the side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were small, so he had plenty of time, and he also, yep. you know, he had a big Rolodex. He knew who to ask for whatever stuff. But I asked him one time. I said, "Why'd you do that?" And he goes, "Well, 
when I die. I want people to think he died too early. I wish he'd been around a little longer. He goes, wow. if I had ripped them all off, they think he didn't die fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I believe in that. I think that if there's people that helped you get where you're at, you should you know help them. Pay you know, it forward. And, and, mm. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, so I've tried to live my life that way because it's karma. And, uh, you know, you try to have it positive as you can. That's incredible. So how long did it take overall from idea to acquisition of this thrombectomy wow. device? It was about 12 years. Wow. And so, but that's not unusual, correct? No, I mean, that's, I, you know, no. in, the, in the world of medical devices where you're making a big impact on a big market, I mean, that's probably yeah, par it, for the course. Right. It changed to that because early in my career, really early, it was a lot faster. I mean, mm -hmm. there were ideas I could see out and, you know, a couple years at most, they were done. But towards the end of it, I mean, I was one of the, my, I was with Mike Dake and some other people at uh, TCT, which uh, Transcatheter Therapeutics meeting at DC, and we were sitting around with Cook talking about their drug eluding stent. Now the stent was done. They were talking about the trial, and it was ten year, almost over ten years before that thing got approved in the United States. And I mean. That shows you it's a decade <laughs> and it's That's not, incredible. it's not for the faint of heart, but you don't give up. I mean, if you're, if you believe in your idea, it's got a big market and you can, you know, and have people that are honest with you to tell you, Hey, this is the upside. This is the downside. This is what we're have to take it. You don't give up because that, you know, because at the end of the rainbow, you are going to be real successful. If nothing else, you're going to help patients and hopefully you're going to get re you know, reinforced positively in a financial uh, standpoint as well. And you have to decide, do you want a single, double, triple, or a home run? And without a doubt, a home run is you create it, you patent it, you do everything. You get clinical data, maybe even sales, and then you sell it to a strategic. That's the home on run. Your own. Yeah, on, on your own. On your own. own. With, because you know, you're not giving up equity, as much yeah. equity along the way, or giving exactly, up as much right. control. Yeah. If you have to give up equity venture capitalists, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Now, sometimes you have to because mm -hmm. you need either their expertise or their money. But right. if you could do it another way, uh, that's much better for you. If you go venture capital route, I've seen some inventors end up with low single digits, you know, to okay. almost a very single digit, which, you know, changes the whole you know, experience. But the, well, the risk reward, I'm sure, obviously, at that point, you put in so much effort and you're like, OK, yeah. A lot of people are getting rich off of what I did or what I started, at least. Right. Um, yeah. I remember one of the people I had to convince was my wife. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what do you mean you're not going to have 70% of that? <laughs> oh, gosh. Yep. That probably took a, a staged conversation. Well, with... I mean, and, and it's, you know, once you start to introduce her, all the people and, you know, mm -hmm. what it really takes, the regulatory, you know, everything, you know. The business. The, the legal the... stuff. I mean. Yep. It, it just takes, like you said, it takes a village. It, and if you try to just do it, mm. and people sometimes want to come up with an idea, just sell a patent. I haven't seen that work very often. There's occasional, okay, but um, that's a single because it's not going to usually end up with a bunch of money from that standpoint. Agreed. I think that's, that's probably the hardest thing to see these days is you're seeing smart physicians who also have good clinical needs and they they have good solutions to those clinical needs, but you know maybe it ends up in a, in a provisional patent and they're wondering, why can't I sell this? Why isn't anybody interested? And it's because, you know, you tell me, but the bar has just gotten so high these days that you just have to go further down the road than you ever thought you would have to, and which requires a team. Yeah. And, and, and here's other things they have to realize is that for like a public company, risk is not what they like to do. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they, they like to make sound investments and really know the outcomes of those investments. A smaller company is going to be more risk positive because that's what they're doing. But as you go through, I mean, that's the trade-off as you go down this road is, you know, are you going to be in the risk environment or the non-risk environment? And the more non-risk, the more stuff you're going to have to have. Patents, experience, mm -hmm. clinical, that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's it. that's the definite take home here. So what are you guys working on now? 
Well, I'm still working on this one to get it in the hospitals to get it, you know, the uptake. Uh, we have a couple other things in the back of the back burner that we're still thinking about patents on. You never stop thinking this way, right? I mean, it was funny. The one, the, the one device that I didn't ever get to where I wanted it to, and it was just too early, was a radiation protection table that was mm. simple. You could put it underneath a sterile sheet. It cut down. You know, the radiation on the other side was cut down by 90%. You could take actually a monitor, put it on your chest, and it cut it down by 54%. Mayo Clinic wow. looked at it and said it does more than you think it does. But, and I spent $30,000 on a patent search and didn't get a patent because I didn't know the, you know, I really did know that a lot of stuff gets rejected at first. And, you are you know, are you throwing good money after bad and all that kind of stuff? On a patent, you're saying a patent gets rejected yeah, often at, at exactly. first. And it, totally true. It, it feels like it's almost their job to do that. Exactly. And I, I thought, and I had another thing that was a, it was called the Ansel Sizing Sphere. It was like, you know, because we, our eyeballs and magnification, we don't know what size stuff is. And so we had ball bearings. Ball bearings are consistently the right size. And right. I put one in an EKG pad so you could just put it like on the side for the renal or on the leg for the, yeah, right. and it worked really well. But as so the company goes, there's no money in this. <laughs> mm, and that's how you have to think. I you mean, that's, do. you have you... to change your mindset and start thinking about market size and strategic, you know, goals and, and how they can expand business. And a, a, an EKG lead is probably a dollar or something, right. and, you know, you were going to make it a dollar fifty, maybe. Exactly. Um, and going through the process, as you know, isn't cheap. So, yeah. you know, how, uh, yeah, how long would it take them to recoup their investment? Mm-hmm. That's a big calculation. And that even for the entrepreneur. So how much are you going to put in? How much is it going to get charged? Does it have a billing code? Mm-hmm. You know, all those kind of things. Because if there's no billing code, you know, Medicare doesn't like to give new billing codes very easily. And if they no. do, they're going to take it for something else. Right. It, it's a zero-sum so game. It, yeah. it is. And so it's like, you know, you can't add costs to a procedure unless there's some upside to it that you can prove. And there's different drivers. You know, the physician, he just wants to be efficient and get get his case done, get reimbursed well. The hospital wants to do it as cheap as they can at the time they deliver it. And then now maybe for the first 30 days, not have them come back. The mm-hmm. payer wants it like that for two and a half, three years, because that's how long people stay on insurance. Mm-hmm. And the patient wants it forever. So you got different drivers, you know, hospitals, yeah, stakeholders, love yeah, yeah, different the, stakeholders have is. different desires. And so you have to think about what, how are you affecting the different stakeholders as you go to mm-hmm. tell your story? And if you can't tell a value story for, you know, the stakeholders who might purchase it, it's not going to be, not going to happen. That's a great point. And tell me, so as we wrap up a little bit, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs, uh, physician entrepreneurs who are starting out? Maybe they have a, an idea they want to test or, you know, a, a company they want to approach with a, with a device idea. I mean, what, what, do you, what would you tell them? Yeah. Trust no one okay. other than yourself. <laughs> and, and the reality of it is, I mean, it's not because of my personal experience, as much as other people tell me about how they had this idea, they talked about it on stage and somebody ran out and submitted that thing to a, the patent office about a, you know, like a day or two later. It was like ridiculous. It was for one of the first carotid devices. Really? Yeah. And it, it's changed nowadays. So what you have to do is decide, okay, am I doing this to become a company like Shockwave where I'm going to go out and sell it on my own or Inari? It was such a big demand for this that I'm going to be able to do this as a company no matter what, or am I only doing this to sell it? And, you know, when you go to do strategics, have a non-disclosure agreement. Now realize that those are limited to oftentimes to two or three years. So you got to be far enough along the road. You don't want to tell them too early because not that they're dishonest, but sometimes your memory forgets where you heard this idea or how you learned of this idea. Mm -hmm. And people change in those companies too, but you have to be able to tell your story it has to be one really good for patients. It's got to be, and I live by this one, doctors do what's easy within one standard deviation of efficacy. So if you make their job harder, it's going to be a hard sell. Hmm. You have to make it easy. You have to make it not add more cost to the procedure unless there's a up co- uh, you know, a reason that you're going to make money down the road for the hospital or the strategic or something like that. But you have to kind of go through this 
protecting yourself. Always have NDAs. You know, don't don't give away your ideas. Use a really good business person before mm-hmm. you start going to the companies. I think that, you know, yes, you're going to, you know, have to maybe give away some of those profits, but you're more likely to actually have a positive outcome. That's fantastic. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is summarize a little bit about what we've spoken about. And please interrupt me if you need to add something or or edit or anything along those lines. So one of the first things we talked about is you, the advice that uh, one of the IRs gave you, which was go after a big need with big numbers and make a really have a really good answer to solve it. And then you said build, have a good business team behind you. And that I think that's a very core. I think you could take that and almost say that could be your your principles that you use when you're trying to decide whether you should go after something or not. Totally agree. Okay. And then next, I have to talk about this because it's been kind of the 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 concept that keeps coming up throughout your life. So basically, and because it worked well for you, relationships where you're working with larger companies to make a new device, it's basically becoming harder and harder. I think you still had trouble doing it, but it ended up working for you. But nowadays, it just seems like that that would not happen the same way. Uh, right. We've talked about how you've got to go further de-risking your device. You need a, a provisional patent and going to cut it. You need a granted patent. Then, you know, a prototype and going to cut it. You need uh, a commercial device with early sales. And that takes money. So th- it's something for the physicians and the inventors out there to think about that you know, the days of just being able to come up with an idea on the back of a napkin and taking it to your rep and, and you're going to make millions of dollars after that and, and affect patient lives, probably gone. Agree. Okay. And then, uh, you know, find problems you want to solve. You had this uh, problem you were dealing with organized clot that was really sticky and hard. And so you needed a thrombectomy device that would, that would solve that problem. That's why you started working on it with with another company, and it worked out very well. So finding problems that you that bother you, you know, we spoke with Fred Lee, the inventor, uh, one of the early founders of of New Wave uh, ablation company, and he just hated the uh, you know the, uh, the 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 problems that came with the radio frequencies ablation, and found that microwave was uh, a great way of solving it. So. I'm going to iterate this again. We're going to say this again because we've we talked about it a lot, but it's so important. Get a business person early on. You said it. It's indispensable. Every phys- Almost every physician entrepreneur that I've spoken with has had a great business person that I've interviewed. You know, they always say, oh, my right-hand man or this person. You don't realize what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And a business person can shed a lot of light on those things. Right. The only thing I'd probably add to that, thinking back on all this and listening to you, is that there are some incubators that will help inventors. Okay. And, yeah, and that's a good if point. You can, if you can find one of those, they'll help you through the process. Uh, again, many of them won't break the bank. They'll they'll facilitate, but ultimately the money and stuff you're going to have to come up with. But as far as ferreting it out, getting it figured out, those kind of things. Uh, some of those incubators are actually pretty good. Great. And then don't give up. <laughs> it takes a long time. You yeah. know, it sounds like it was 12 years for for your thrombectomy, for Embolitech, for the whole course of the device. But if nothing else you're going to get out of it, you're going to help patients. And at best, you get a return on investment that can be that can be life changing. Yep, I totally agree. Gary, thank you so much. That was incredible. Really enjoyed having you on the show. Super. Thanks, Brian. I really enjoyed being on there. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Backtable Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable Innovation is produced and hosted by Brian Hartley, Aaron Fritz, and Eric Yamaker. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ann Dang, social media and PR by Chi Dang, and Dana Parker. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.